The University of California Natural Reserve System preserves a cross-section of representative California landscapes, deserts, forests, high Sierra mountains, and coastal environments for teaching, research, and public outreach. The Hastings Natural History Reservation, set in the foothills of the Santa Lucia Mountains in Central California, consists of more than 2,300 acres of perennial grasslands, oak woodlands, chaparral, and running streams. Farmers who settled the area in the 1850s built this pole barn out of logs split with black powder. They cleared the valley floor for crops and fattened cattle in the surrounding grasslands. In 1927, Francis and Russell Hastings a wealthy San Francisco couple purchased the property as a retreat for their family. In 1937, the Hastings offered use of the land to UC Berkeley as a biological research station. Joseph Grinnell, director of the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at Berkeley, accepted their offer and established a research program to monitor the abandoned agricultural fields as they reverted back to their natural state. When the university created the natural reserve system, the Hastings Reserve became one of the original seven sites. The Hastings daughter, Fanny Arnold, who grew up and attended school on the ranch, continues to be a major supporter of the reserve today. The Hastings Reserve is known worldwide for its long-term studies of the area's mammals, birds, forests, and grasslands. Weather data has been tracked on the reserve since the 1920s, and many of the scientific test plots date back to the 1940s. Such long-term data collection is crucial to scientists studying major questions such as global climate change and the status of native California plants and animals. Many of the original ranch buildings have been adapted and updated for the use of both visiting and residential scientists. Researcher Walt Koenig is one of those scientists. Koenig has been studying acorn woodpeckers at Hastings since the 1970s. Acorn woodpeckers are really fun to watch. They're, they have this beautiful clown-shaped plumage and they have interesting vocalizations and of course their behavior turns out to be really fascinating. Uh, unfortunately, they turn out to be pretty difficult to study in some ways. You have to spend a lot of time on ladders and up ropes climbing trees, but the advantage of that is that it takes a long time to do it, so I've been able to really devote a lot of my career to figuring out what the heck they're doing. Earlier researchers had established that acorn woodpeckers are rare among bird species because they are cooperative breeders. They band together in groups of four to six, and all the adults in the group care for the young in the nest. Koenig's goal was to develop a deeper understanding of their social organization. Each year he visits the nests in his study area to band each chick so it can be easily identified throughout its life. Well, the size of our study area has varied a little bit over the years, but we follow 30 to 40 groups. Uh, and, and a couple of hundred birds, depending on how, how good the breeding season was. Uh, acorn woodpeckers are highly dependent on acorns, and, and two years ago was a very good acorn crop, uh, and the birds just went crazy last spring, so we banded 200 or 250 babies out there, uh, many of which we're still hoping will be around this following spring. Koenig takes a blood sample that will be tested in the reserve's DNA laboratory to determine the chick's parentage, and then measures and weighs each chick. The young birds can vary in size dramatically depending upon parentage and the ready availability of food. We were able to document for the first time that females lay their eggs communally and and that in itself was very exciting because it's something that's only known from a few species of birds anywhere in the world. Then as I studied them more we were able to discover more interesting aspects of their behavior. One of the things that I really got into back when I was doing my thesis in the 70s was that uh, these groups are very close-knit but when the breeders of one sex or the other die you end up 
you can get these incredible fights among helpers, what are known as helpers, these are non-breeders and other groups that converge on the territory and literally fight it out to see who's going to get to fill that vacancy. Uh, and this was, they're, they're really exciting things to see, we used to call them power struggles. Over the years, Koenig has expanded his study to look at other aspects of the acorn woodpecker's behavior, including the intense competition within a group for breeding opportunities. I mentioned uh, that more than one female can lay eggs in the same nest cavity. Those females are usually sisters or a mother and a daughter, so they're close relatives themselves. Uh, but even though they're close relatives, they do so, they, they lay eggs in a way that demonstrates that there's a lot of competition between them. In particular, the first female that lays her egg will typically have that egg taken out of the nest and destroyed by the other female, even though it's a close relative of her. And what they do actually is they take the egg out, put it up in a granary somewhere, and then everybody in the group comes and eats it. Very few animals have a mating system that involves these levels of both competition and cooperation. Koenig compares it to lions, where the males form coalitions to gain access to prides of females. So it's a very similar situation with acorn woodpeckers that larger coalitions of birds we know are more competitive for filling uh, reproductive vacancies in, in these power struggles, these big fights that, that occur to fill them. Uh, and then the downside of that, of course, is that once they filled the vacancy together, these, these coalitions then have to somehow figure out who's, how they're going to partition the reproductive potential of the group. And that's something that's, that's the aspect of their behavior that we're really looking at it right now to try to figure out. Live long and prosper. Yeah, bye-bye. Hastings has, has been critical to this, my study and, and other studies like this. It's, and part of the reason is because we need, in order to do the kind of work we're interested in, we really need to have a lot of access to the land. We need to be able to go there any time to be able to catch birds, because often we're catching them at pre-dawn. And, and doing just crazy things to try to figure out some particular problem or do some experiment. Um, and they're, it's just not feasible to be able to do that sort of thing when you have, uh, in, in a lot of public places where there are people potentially wandering around getting in the way of things or destroying equipment or whatever. And so it's, it's been critical to have access to, uh, to have this beautiful study site. Of course, in my case, right in my own backyard, so I could just walk out my door and go chase after the birds. And that's what's really allowed us to, to maintain this project over this rather strikingly long period. Acorn woodpeckers are not the only birds that have been the subject of long-term studies at Hastings. UC Berkeley researcher Janice Dickinson has been studying the social structure of western bluebirds at the reserve since the 1980s. The bluebirds seem to have a much simpler social structure than acorn woodpeckers. Pairs mate for life, while non-breeding birds help at the nest. But they are also very adaptable. What's interesting about bluebirds is how plastic they are in their social behaviors. So you can learn a lot. If, if all of the individuals in a population do the same thing, you can't learn very much. But if you have individuals doing many different things, you can compare the cause or the consequence of, that be of those different behaviors. And so bluebirds, because some individuals are migratory, some stay, some, are, some populations are exclusively migratory, some are resident, uh, some sons stay home, some move to other groups, some sons help, other sons breed, other sons in their first year of life act as floaters instead of breeding on their own. Uh, because you have that tremendous diversity and you have an interesting decision-making process on the, on the part of individual birds that leads to that diversity, um, you can understand a lot of phenomena that are um, less easy to understand in species where helping is, is just the general rule or 
uh, floating is difficult to detect. Dickinson and her students spend much of their time in the field observing the bluebirds. She has installed artificial nest boxes and feeders throughout the reserve. She regularly captures chicks to take blood samples and measurements. Testing of the blood samples in the reserve laboratory has produced surprising results. With molecular genetics, we discovered that half of the female bluebirds are copulating with males other than their pair bonded mate. So you see chicks in the nest that are sired not just by the caregiving male, but by some other male in the population. We're in the pro process of identifying and characterizing what kinds of males uh, those are. Uh, what we know now is that females are more likely to accept these extra pair copulations from males that are older than their mate, and the greater the age difference, the more likely they are to accept. So we're in the process of looking at plumage cues that can tell age, and at the fitness benefits that females get from mating with these extra pair males. Um, it's a surprise. It's, ha it's something that's happening in a lot of socially monogamous birds. Uh, it's particularly surprising in something like the bluebird, which isn't just monogamous this year, but it's with the same mate essentially for life. And their divorce rate is 6%, so they're doing better than we are, uh, yet they have this sort of covert behavior that results in extra pair chicks in the nest. Though Dickinson's work began with basic scientific questions about the evolution of sexual and social behavior, it has also revealed very practical information that might be crucial in conservation efforts to protect the western bluebirds declining population. What we discovered is that because we were marking each individual bird with a diagnostic set of color bands, that the birds were not only resident year-round here, but they were maintaining territories that really didn't differ at all from the territories that they use in the spring. And we think that this pretty much drives the whole social system. It explains why sons stay home with their parents and why they then, if they don't get a mate, end up helping at the nest. Um, these territories are based on mistletoe, which you see here. And mistletoe provides a very stable and a very um, abundant winter food resource. Well. With our long-term data, we then looked at, the, at distance to mistletoe, and we found that if a nest box is within 50 meters of mistletoe, it tends to be used. And if it's farther away than that, it doesn't. Um, the importance of mistletoe was recognized by the, the first director of our museum, who wrote about mistletoe and bluebirds, and basically said that the winter distributions of bluebirds maps onto the distribution of mistletoe. So I went back and looked at that. What nobody knew is that they have these territories, that they defend the mistletoe. And what that means is that if a bird grows up in a nest box or a natural cavity away from mistletoe, it's going to have a really hard time moving into an area with winter food because it's defended. So um, given that and the last 20 years of population declines of western bluebirds in California, that led to the hypothesis that clearing of oaks and removal of mistletoe or placing boxes in places like vineyards with no mistletoe is going to have very detrimental effects on bluebird populations. So the work that I'm engaged in now involves experiments to look at the effect of removing some mistletoe on whether these groups stay here for the winter, whether the suns are retained and, and nest nearby, and all the learning that takes place between parents and offspring in that first year of very extended brood care when those suns do stay home. I don't think I can overemphasize the importance of long-term data. And it's particularly important in population biology, which is kind of the area of ecology that my work falls into. Because, first of all, annual effects are very, very important in any system. And that's one thing we know from our long-term data. So if you take data for a couple of years, you're getting this little slice of the picture that may not reflect the general trends at all. The second reason is that doing one study for a long period of time as an investigator gives you an opportunity to gain a much more penetrating insight into the system. 
and it prevents you from glossing over things that are important because they're continually coming back to you. It also gives you the opportunity to correct your mistakes because you can reanalyze data after 20 years and see if this important result that you got 10 years ago is still supported by the data. So I think that um, the value of long-term studies, we're just beginning to see it, we're beginning to milk these data sets for questions that we didn't even have at the start, including international collaborations uh, to, to do really sophisticated population and viability analyses, um, connections with people who work on other aspects of animal behavior like hormones. Uh, the potential for drawing in people when you have long-term studies is just fantastic. The Hastings Reserve is an excellent place to study birds, but current field research covers a much broader list of topics. Reserve Director Mark Stromberg, for example, focuses on the restoration of California's native grasslands. Grasslands in North America are probably one of the most endangered ecosystems. They've they're been dramatically reduced. Probably only 5% of the grasslands remain. Of course, in the Midwest, people understand this. You know, in Iowa, a native prairie is, is very rare. Um, and similarly, in California, these native prairies are, are rare. Uh, however, their demise just went unnoticed. The big grasslands in California disappeared with the arrival of Europeans. And with the arrival of Europeans, they brought all this kind of uh, annual small vegetation that grows in between the munch grasses. Um, and in the rest of Hastings, which is a lot of old fields, uh, all that's left are these annual plants from Spain. In some places, we still have these big native bunch grasses. Uh, and these are what we've been studying about how to, how to uh, what, what makes these things tick, um, how can you get them reestablished. There are a lot of people who'd like to restore them. They have a, um, a lot of really great natural values. The, these grasses can live to be 200 years and maybe as long as a thousand years. They're green now, they green up early, this is now early in the year, and provide forage for all kinds of things that need to eat grass and they will stay green right through the hot, hot season, right into September, October, November. They, they're less flammable. Um, as you can see, they provide a kind of a nice visual uh, texture to the landscape, and they um, are very tough and hardy. Th that is, this landscape here is now held together by fibrous roots underground that you can't see very well, and is protecting the watershed, keeping this hill in place. So there's a lot of good values that these plants have. While scientists have developed a good understanding of native grasses in the last decade, it is only much more recently that they've developed good restoration techniques. There was a uh, senator from Kansas who said that uh, grass is the forgiveness of nature. And that is really true. Grasses are the first things that you can put back on an old field, on a, on, a, on a landscape that's been just scraped to the ground. And the grasses sort of forgive that rough treatment of the ground and come back and provide sort of the fibrous basis, the underground kind of structure that is there for the insects to come back on, the birds to breed in, the uh, flowers to have their little annual flowers in between. And um, that's the idea of restoring these uh, old fields is to return sort of the basic structure and then we hope, we assume, and this is what we're going to learn in the next 20 years, is that these places that where we put the grasses back, the ecological function comes back. One of the problems is that these, the, although it's a big grass plant, it only makes a few seeds, maybe 20, 30 seeds, and they fall just a few feet away from the mother plant here. And as you can see, that these things are very well spaced. And they're spaced far apart like this because California has droughts, and during a drought, these big plants can extract all the soil moisture in the area around it with their big long roots. So this means that even their little babies in between will die in a drought. And so that when they disappear then you have these big mother plants sort of spaced out reflecting how many plants can survive in the, the driest year that they're here. When these seeds just fall a few inches away from the mother plant, they don't uh, the, the, the dispersal distance is very small. 
these fields are huge. I mean, a 40-acre field, uh, given a plant that's going to only produce two or three live plants in five years, means that it's going to take hundreds of years for these plants to move across into these old fields. So one of the things I've been looking at is how you can accelerate the restoration or the return of nature to these uh, open fields, these old fields, the level hillsides that were farmed from 1860 to 1930. Um, California is full of these grain fields that were abandoned in the Depression era when the price of grain went to zero. And people abandoned homesteads here all over the place. But now these are places where people live. Often they're building expensive homes or uh, these are parklands or open spaces that are protected. So one of the things that we've been doing, uh, and I'd like to show you later on, is how you can promote the spread of these by controlling these kinds of weeds in between, or non-native plants, and promoting the little s delicate seeds that come from the native plants and getting them way out in those fields. Stromberg's vision is not only to re-establish native plants in abandoned farmlands, but also to promote their use in landscaping around homes and businesses. Um, this is a really interesting landscaping kind of view of California. California does go brown like this in the fall. And if you're going to build a home or have a home, this is the kind of landscaping that you ought to consider. It um, is visually diverse. It requires no water, uh, no maintenance. Um, and it is uh, uh, what California looked like. Uh, a lot of people try to remake their home as if it were Ohio and you're, you're growing Kentucky bluegrass in front of your home. Um, this is the California uh, grass, this is the, the native landscape, and it's a very pleasant place to be. Another aspect of the native grasses that interests Stromberg is their relationship with California's oaks. This work indicates a close relationship between these species. If you plant an acorn out in this non-native mix of annual plants from Europe, the acorns don't do very well. In fact, they almost all die. Um, uh, so the non-native grass has this very negative effect on our acorns. And, and you look at Hastings, and one of the things that, that Jim Griffin noticed 20 years ago, 30 years ago, was that in these blue oak woodlands, there are no saplings, there are no seedlings. And the reason for that is competition with the grasses. The non-native exotic grasses can take the moisture better than the oak seedling can. And the other thing that happens, we have a lot of gophers here at Hastings. And virtually every little seedling oak that we look at only makes it to about the second or third year and a gopher comes along and clips it off at the ground and kills it. What, what we've done is uh, planted uh, oaks in the middle of the uh, bunch grasses and then out on the middle out here and done an experiment to see that what, we, what we've noticed and what you've seen as we walked around is that both the gophers and the pigs eat up and, you know, tear up the soil in between these big bunches, but they leave it alone in the middle. So if you, the thought was if we planted a little oak in the middle of the grass clump here, it would protect it. The way you, you, the way you plant an oak now to reproduce, to have it just to go, is you have to build a little wire basket to protect it from the gophers, and you put the wire basket in the ground and put the acorn in that. So instead of a wire basket, we put the acorns in these bunch grasses, and every one of the acorns that was planted out here died, and about half of the acorns that are planted inside the bunch grasses are still doing great. This is an experiment that may have to go 20 years. Stromberg is working with a nearby commercial grower to develop a seed source that will support the widespread use of native grasses for landscaping and restoration projects. Uh, there's a lot of, there's probably 20 or 30 great reasons to grow native grasses. The problem is that there's not a lot of seed available for the grasses. And so about 10 years ago, we met with uh, our neighbor here on this ranch here in Carmel Valley to discuss the possibility of starting a farm that would specialize in raising commercial quantities of native grasses and other plants. Uh, we did a number of studies on, the, on small trial plots to learn about how to grow grasses on a commercial scale. To, to get these local seeds, you, you can simply start with just a handful of seeds. You can collect maybe four or five hundred seeds. 
Um, these are then put in small plugs. The plugs are grown in greenhouses and then they're individually placed in, in the field here and you get this a large uh, seed production here. You get literally hundreds of pounds of seed here. So you've gone from just a handful of seed to hundreds of pounds of seed in one year. These, many of these grasses are, are just grown because of uh, particular contracts that somebody wants a, 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 a part, you know, a, some specific grass for some reason. The National Park Service, the Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management and private landowners are all clients here and they will contract out from a small handful of seeds to have a hundred or a thousand pounds of seed delivered later in the year or the next year. The poet Gary Snyder once observed, we must consciously, fully accept and recognize that this land is where we live and grasp the fact that our descendants will be here for millennia to come. Then we must honor this land's great antiquity, its wilderness, learn it, and work to hand it on to the children of the future with its biodiversity and health intact. Over time, the challenge Snyder recognized will become even more pressing. As California's population continues to grow, as development pressures escalate, as precious natural resources are stretched to their limits. The University of California's natural reserve system will continue to play a crucial role in providing vital solutions to a sustainable future. Management and planning techniques pioneered in these protected areas are increasing our understanding of how to work with and within natural systems and cycles. Long-term scientific studies on the reserve are deepening our perception of California ecosystems, helping us anticipate and respond to complex environmental problems. Future generations of scientists trained at the reserves will build on today's research to develop tomorrow's discovery and insights. Outreach programs that bring younger students to the reserves will help create a knowledgeable public that grasps the importance of environmental protection. California's future viability requires a deep understanding of the state's native ecosystems. Such understanding can only be developed through years of meticulous field study and observation. Hastings Reserve and the protected lands of the University of California's Natural Reserve System provide an unmatched opportunity to conduct studies in protected environments.